Shortly before 3.50 p.m. on May 31, 1916, the first of many salvos was fired by the German First Scouting Group in the opening action of the Battle of Jutland, the run to the south. Their targets, the 1st and 2nd British battlecruiser squadrons, were giving chase, and now that they had closed their range, they formed their battle line. The British battle line was formed with the flagship Lion leading, followed by Princess Royal, Queen Mary, Tiger, and the two ships of the 2nd Battlecruiser Squadron, New Zealand and Indefatigable. The British ships were given their targets, where the flagship Lion and the 2nd ship Princess Royal were ordered to fire on the leading German ship Lutzo, and the other ships were to follow along down the line, with Queen Mary firing on Deflinge, Tiger on Zeidlitz, New Zealand on Motka, and Indefatigable on von der Tan. Lion and Princess Royal did as they were ordered. However, Queen Mary fired on Zeidlitz and not Deflinge, leaving her unmolested for almost 10 minutes. Regardless of that error, Queen Mary was one of the best gunnery ships in the Grand Fleet, excelling at the speed school that was favored by people like Admiral David Beatty. However, this obsession with speed led to unsafe practices like stacking ammunition outside protective magazines and leaving the anti-flash doors open during drills or battles, like the one she was currently engaged in. Later in the battle past 4.20 p.m., Queen Mary was hit several times, and at 4.26, she exploded. Well over 1,200 men perished. All officers except four midshipmen died, with a total of just 20 survivors. Admiral Beatty, the 1st and 2nd Battlecruiser Squadrons, along with the 5th Battle Squadron of Queen Elizabeth-class dreadnoughts, set off from the Firth of Forth late in the evening of the 30th of May, 1916, as Admiral John Jellicoe, Commander-in-Chief of the Grand Fleet, had departed earlier in the evening to support the advance of the battlecruisers. Beatty headed east over the North Sea as British intelligence understood the German scouting groups under Admiral Franz von Hipper and the High Seas Fleet under Admiral Reinhard Scheer were making an advance into the North Sea to engage and destroy a portion of the Grand Fleet. Ideally, at least. A possible target was Beatty's ships, as Nick Jellicoe writes in his book, Jutland, the Unfinished Battle, the Germans could read Beatty's character perhaps better than Beatty realized. They knew he was a fox hunting man. They knew that he would run into the chase and that this was their chance to lure a portion of British naval forces into the waiting guns of Sheer, heading north not far behind with the main battle fleet. Between 2.20 and 2.30, either side's cruiser forces had spotted smoke over the horizon and within an hour, the two sides came into view. Upon seeing the British ships at around 3.30, Hipper understood that Beatty intended to cut him off from his home base, and made a turn of 180 degrees to the south. Intending to close the gap, Beatty increased speed, leaving the four Queen Elizabeth-class ships behind. By 340, the battlecruisers had formed a single line ahead steaming south, with Lion leading, followed by Princess Royal, Queen Mary, Tiger, New Zealand, and Indefatigable. However, the Germans opened up the battle win at 348 while smoking a cigar, Hipper gave the order to open fire. The two sides began engaging each other, where on the German side, Georg von Hasse, SMS der Flinge's first artillery officer, has this to say in Jutland 1916, Death in Grey Waters by Nigel Steele and Peter Hart. All was ready to open fire. The tension increased every second, but I could not yet give the first order to fire. I had to wait for the signal from the flagship. 15,000, as my last order rang out, there was a dull roar, I looked ahead. The Lutzo is firing her first salvo, and immediately the signal, open fire, is hoisted. In the same second, I shout, salvos fire, and like thunder, our first salvo crashes out. The ships astern follow suit at once, and we see all around the enemy jets of fire and rolling clouds of smoke. As I mentioned in the introduction, fire distribution was an issue for the British during the opening stage of the battle. Beatty intended for Lion and Princess Royal to fire on the leading German ship Lutzo, while the others followed along down the line, with Queen Mary firing on Deflinge, Tiger on Zeidlitz, New Zealand on Motke, and Indefatigable on von der Tan. Lion and Princess Royal fired on Lutzo as they should have done, but Queen Mary fired on Zeidlitz, leaving Deflinge unmolested. Still, Queen Mary was considered a crack gunnery ship in the Grand Fleet, and as such, she opened fire in earnest. In part, she got that reputation because of people like Petty Officer Ernest Francis and X Turret, where he was watching his men like a hawk to ensure they were ready to fire, writing, We had started on the great game. I had no means of telling what the time was, 
and if I had, I probably should not have looked because getting a turret started is an anxious rushing time for a captain of a turret. Once started, it is easy to keep going. The gun's crew was perfect, inclined to be a little swift in loading, but I gave them a yell and pointed out to them that I wanted a steady stride, and after that, everything went like clockwork. Lieutenant Ewart came out to the cabinet twice and yelled something to encourage the gun's crew and yelled out to me, All right, Francis? Loading the shells in the cordite charges wasn't a simple process, and any problems had to be dealt with immediately to minimize the disruption of firing. Where Francis continues, Suddenly, both rammers gave out, my gun going first. This was caused by number three opening the breach before the gun had run out after firing. The carrier arm must have hit the rammer head and slightly metal bound it. I dropped the elevating wheel, got hold of a steel pinch bar, and forced the end behind the rammer head, at that same time putting the rammer lever over to run out. Out went the rammer. I rushed it back again, and then out again, and it was all gay once more. Then the lever was passed over to the right gun, and both rammers were once more in working order. I was pleased to get them going again, as it would have been such a damper on the crew if we had had to go into hand loading. Francis and X turret in company with the other 13.5 inch guns of Queen Mary opened up on Zeidlitz at a range of 17,500 yards, and it wasn't too long after when Queen Mary scored her first hit on Zeidlitz. She hit Zeidlitz near frame 116 and caused the starboard switch room and starboard turbo dynamo room to fall out. Not two minutes later, Queen Mary found her mark once again, striking the barbette of C turret. The shell penetrated the 230mm thick armored plate and ignited munitions in the working chamber. Turret C was immediately enveloped in a large yellow smoke cloud, and the turret was burnt out. Turning to what Corvette and Capitaine Forrester, Zeidlitz's gunnery officer wrote, as found in Gary Staff's Skagerrak, the Battle of Jutland through German eyes. Then, approximately 10 minutes after opening fire, Pablo reported to me, by telephone, Turret Caesar does not give any answer. From the speaking tube of Turret Caesar, smoke is penetrating the artillery central. This was exactly the same report I received on January 24th on the Dogger Bank, also at the battle's beginning. I therefore knew what this report signified. The cartridges were in flames, and the turret was put out of action. Almost mechanically, I gave the order, Flood Magazine of Turret C. This put the chamber under water and prevented further damage. As Forster mentioned, Zeidlitz was nearly fatally hit in sea turret at Dogger Bank. If not for the heroic efforts of three sailors, the ship would have most likely been lost, causing changes in the high seas fleet. Where Captain Moritz von Egedy writes, Therefore, we made technical improvements and changed our methods of training, as well as the regulations. This time, only one cartridge caught fire. The flash did not reach the magazines, and so we only lost 20 dead or severely burned, and only one turret was put out of action. I go into more detail about this in my video on Zeidlitz, about the changes in the High Seas Fleet and these hits. We'll discuss the British reaction later on. Getting back to Queen Mary, in the early part of the battle, it's unclear if Queen Mary was hit. However, the flagship line was hit in the Q turret, amongst other hits. These hits, and especially the one to Q turret, will become consequential later. At 4.03pm, HMS Indefatigable was struck by multiple shells and exploded in a violent manner, in part due to the unsafe practices we discussed earlier. Queen Mary continued to fire on Zeidlitz for a time. Eventually, though, she switched her fire to Deflinga. In turn, Deflinga switched her fire to Queen Mary at 417, although for different reasons. Were to take from Steel and Heart again. Behind them, the Queen Mary was still engaged in an evenly balanced contest with the Zeidlitz until an unfortunate set of circumstances severely disadvantaged the Queen Mary. When the damaged line weaved to starboard and temporarily dropped out of the British line, Von Hasse aboard the Deflinga could not see what was happening. In consequence, when he attempted to engage the second battlecruiser he could see in the British line, he inadvertently switched his fire from the Princess Royal to the Queen Mary at 417. Hampered by smoke for a while, Von Hasse handed over direct control to his spotting officer in the foretop. Now, his pre-battle fantasies were becoming a reality as the Leviathans exchanged mighty blows, although it was hardly a fair fight at two-on-one. With both Zeidlitz and Deflinga firing hard at the Queen Mary, the barrage of accurate shells soon began to tell. Taking from Francis again, There was a heavy blow struck, 
I should imagine in the after 4 inch battery and a lot of dust and pieces flying around the X turret. My attention was called by the turret trainer, A.B. Long, who reported the front glass of his periscope blocked up. This was not very important because we are in director training, but someone in the rear heard him report his glass foul and without orders, dashed on top and cleared it. He must have been smashed as he did it, for he fell in front of the periscope groaning and fell off the turret. I wish I knew his name, poor chap, but it's no use guessing. Another blow fell in the battlecruiser as midshipman Jocelyn Story writes, Everything went beautifully until 421, when Q turret was hit by heavy shell and the right gun put out of action. We continued firing with the left gun for two or three minutes, and then the awful explosion took place which broke the ship in half by the foremast. Our left gun broke off outside the turret and the rear fell into the working chamber. The right gun also slid down. The turret was filled with flying metal and several men were killed. A lot of cordite caught fire below me and blazed up, and several people were gassed. Deflinge and Zeidlitz increased their fire, and at 425 and 426, Queen Mary was struck by salvos again, where staff writes, Deflinge changed target to Queen Mary and was firing at a range of 132 hectometers, while Queen Mary's opposite number, Zeidlitz, was firing at her at a range of 135 hectometers. At 526 hours, three projectiles of a four-shell salvo were seen to strike Queen Mary, but the only result appeared to be a small smoke and dust cloud. And then another salvo of four shells, two struck the ship, and a tremendous yellow flame erupted, and the ship disappeared in a huge cloud of smoke. Queen Mary was most likely struck in the forward part of the ship, and one shell detonated a forward magazine of either A or B turret. On the German side, von Hasse wrote after the battle, And so, the Queen Mary and the Deflinge fought out a regular gunnery duel over the destroyer action that was raging between us. But the poor Queen Mary was having a bad time. In addition to the Deflinge, she was being engaged by the Zeidlitz, and the gunnery officer of the Zeidlitz, Corvette and Capitaine Forrester, was our crack gunnery expert, tried in all the previous engagements in which the ship had taken part. Cool-headed and of quick decision. The Zeidlitz only carried 28cm guns. These could not pierce the thickest armor of Queen Mary, but every ship has less heavily armored places that can be pierced with great damage even by a 28cm shell. About 5.26pm was the historic moment when the Queen Mary, the proudest ship of the English fleet, met her doom. Since 5.26pm, every one of our salvos had straddled the enemy. When the salvo fired at 5.26 fell, heavy explosions had already begun in the Queen Mary. First of all, a vivid red flame shot up from her forepart. Then came an explosion forward, which was followed by a much heavier explosion amidships. Black debris from the ship flew into the air, and immediately afterwards, the whole ship blew up with a terrific explosion. A gigantic cloud of smoke rose. The mass collapsed inwards. The smoke cloud hit everything and rose higher and higher. Finally, nothing but a thick black cloud of smoke remained where the ship had been. At its base, the smoke column only covered a small area, but it was widened towards the summit and looked like a monstrous black pine. I estimated the height of the smoke column at from 300 to 400 meters. Two things before we continue. One, remember this is a German account, so the timing is different. And two, authors like Staff are critical of Haas's account due to his downplaying of Zeidlitz's role, noting that Moltke's 28cm shells penetrated Tiger's 9-inch belt. In any case, this is what Forrester had to say from Zeidlitz. Suddenly, on our opponent, I saw a flash in the aft ship that grew visibly, and this offered to the eye a scene that can move one deeply. But this could not be thought of. In a giant smoke cloud, the ship seemed to lift itself from the water, shattered in the middle, with debris flying all around. The whole picture is framed in a blue-red fire glow. In my battle protocol, I find written, 522 hours, our opponent has blown up, Direction 88, 130 hectometers. After a moment of hesitation, the report was passed everywhere on the ship, through the telephone and speaking tubes. Our opponent has blown up. Blau Seidlitz was the reply, and with doubled enthusiasm, they went to work. Target change right on the next ship in the enemy line, I commanded, and the two-way fight continued on the new opponent. The awful death of Queen Mary was captured by an officer from Tiger's Bridge. I saw one salvo straddle her, Three shells out of four hit. The next salvo straddled her, and two more shells hit her. As they hit, I saw a dull red glow amidships, 
and then the ship seemed to open up like a puffball or one of those toadstool things when one squeezes it. Then there was another dull red glow somewhere forward, and the whole ship seemed to collapse inwards. The funnel and mass fell into the middle of the ship, and the hull was blown outwards. The roof of the turrets were blown a hundred feet high. Then everything was smoke, and a bit of the stern was the only part of the ship above the water. The tiger put helm hard to starboard, and we just cleared the remains of the Queen Mary stern by a few feet. Out of the 1,286 men on board, only a handful survived. All officers except four midshipmen died, a total of 20 survivors. Among the dead was the Japanese observer and naval attaché in London, Commander Chisuki Shimamura. The ships around, including both the battle cruisers and escorting destroyers, could only briefly pause as the battle continued, and she slipped beneath the waves. Before the ship slipped beneath the waves, I want to discuss the plight of the survivors, as although the initial damage was tremendous in its magnitude, there were survivors, namely Ernest Francis and Exturt and several others. Francis writes about the hit and explosion, then came the big explosion, which shook us a bit, and on looking at the pressure gauge, I saw the pressure had failed. Immediately after that came what I termed the big smash, and I was dangling in the air on a bowline, which saved me from being thrown down onto the floor of the turret. These bowlines were an idea brought into my turret, and each man in the gunhouse was supplied with one. As far as I noticed, the men who had them on were not injured in the big smash. Number two and three gun crew on the left gun slipped down under the gun, and the gun appeared to me to have fallen through its trunnions and smashed up these two numbers. For a few short moments, there appeared to be a silence, most likely caused by a mixture of temporary deafness and shock. Everything in the ship went quiet as a church. The floor of the turret was bulged up, and the guns were useless. I must mention here that there was not a sign of excitement. One man turned to me, one man turned to me and said, What do you think has happened? I said, Steady everyone, I will speak to Mr. Ewart. I went back to the cabinet and said, What do you think has happened, sir? He said, God only knows. Well, sir, I said, it's no use keeping them all down here. Why not send them up around the four-inch guns and give them a chance to fight it out? All throughout the ship, the ship's company seemed to think that there was something seriously wrong, as midshipman Peregrine Dearden writes, There was a terrific explosion forward, and I was sent out into the top of our after turret to see what was happening. I had to put on a lung respirator owing to the clouds of smoke and fire. I could see nothing for about a minute, and then all cleared away as the foremost part of the ship went underwater. I then told the officer of the turret that the ship was sinking rapidly, and so as many as possible were got up out of the turret. A midshipman in ex turret John Lloyd Owen has this to say after the explosion. There was a terrific explosion in the fore part of the vessel. I asked the working chamber if they had anything to report. They answered that all the pressure had failed, both guns out of action. I reported this to the officer of the turret, Lieutenant Ewart. He told me that the ship was going down and would probably sink in a few minutes. I asked him for orders, and he told me to send up the gunhouse crew on deck, which I did. After the brief shock, there was a scramble to escape from deep inside the turret. Taking courage, some men led the way, going far beyond the normal call of duty, where Francis writes, Petty Officer Stairs was the last I saw coming up from the working chamber, and he told me it was no use as the water was right up to the trunk leading from the shell room so the bottom of the ship must have been out of her. Then I said, why didn't you come up? He said, there were no orders to leave the turret. I went through the cabinet and out through the top, and Lieutenant Ewart was following me. Suddenly, he stopped and went back into the turret. I believe he went back because he thought there was someone left inside. What was left of the Queen Mary was in bad shape by this point. The deck heeled over to port at an angle of more than 45 degrees, where Francis describes the next scene. The ship had an awful list of port by this time, so much so that men getting off the ladder weren't sliding down to port. I got to the bottom rung of the ladder and could not, by my efforts, reach the stanchions lying on the deck from the ship's side, starboard side. I knew if I let go, I should go sliding down to port like some of the others must have done and probably got smashed up sliding down. Two of my turret's crew, seeing my difficulty, came to my assistance. They were A.B. Long, turret trainer, and A.B. Lane, left gun number four. Lane held Long at full stretch from the ship's side, and I dropped from the ladder, caught Long's legs, and gained the starboard side. These two men had no thought for their safety. They saw I wanted assistance, and that was good enough for them. They were both worth a Victoria Cross twice over.
The plight of the survivors was seen from the other battlecruisers, which to take from able seaman Victor Hayward on HMS Tiger. One by one, men could be seen coming out of the after turret and climbing down onto the exposed bilge keel and jumping into the water. Also, rolls and rolls of white paper came streaming out of her after hatch, situated on her quarter deck. These must have been spare rolls of Dreyer's chart paper because her gunnery officer was situated close to the after hatch. It went trailing away over the boiling sea like a shaking toilet roll. When quite a few men were already in the water, the second explosion occurred. As some of the men piled out of the turret and onto the deck, some hesitated when jumping into the water, as although they could swim, the North Sea is an unforgiving sea, prompting Francis to write, When I got to the ship's side, there seemed to be a fair crowd, and they did not appear to be very anxious to take to the water. I called out to them, Come on, you chaps, who's coming for a swim? Someone answered, She will float for a long while yet. But something I did not pretend to understand what it was seemed to be urging me to get away, so I clambered up over the slimy bilge keel and fell into the water, followed, I should think, by about five more men. After emerging from the turret, Lloyd Owen faced the same scene Francis was looking at, as repeated explosions continued to tear the Queen Mary apart. After all the men had gone out of the turret, I went up myself and found the ship lying on her side. She was broken amidships, her bows were sticking up in the air, and the stern was sticking out of the water at an angle of about 45 degrees from the water. I was standing on the back part of the turret, which was practically level, the turret still being trained to port for most bearing. The vessel lying on her port side. I looked towards the stern and saw that it was red hot and all the plates had been blown away. Nothing of the framework remained. All around us, men were falling off into the water. A few moments afterwards, a tremendous explosion occurred in the forepart of the vessel, which must have blown the bows to atoms. The stern part gave a tremendous lurch, throwing me off into the water. Just before entering the water, another explosion occurred, apparently just above my head. I sank a considerable distance, and on reaching the surface, could see nothing of the ship, only a great deal of wreckage and oil fuel floating on the surface. Another midshipman, Midshipman Story from Q Turret, describes the scene of devastation. The men left, and I got to the ladder leading out of the turret, and climbed quickly. There was no panic or shouting at all. The men were splendid heroes. Just as I got out of the turret and climbed over the funnels and masts that were lying beside the turret and had gotten off my coat and one shoe, another awful explosion occurred, blowing me into the water. The remaining part of the ship, the after part, blew up, the ex turret magazine going off. The final explosions that tore the ship apart were truly cataclysmic and were the ones that most likely killed most of the men in the water near the ship as the crushing shockwaves passed through the water followed by a storm of debris falling from the sky. Where Francis writes, I struck away from the ship as hard as I could and must have covered 50 yards when there was a big smash. Stopping and looking around, the air seemed to be full of fragments and flying pieces. A large piece seemed to be right above my head, and acting on impulse, I dipped under to avoid being struck and stayed under as long as I could and then came up to the top again. Coming behind me, I heard a rush of water, which looked very much like surf breaking on a beach and I realized it was the suction or backwash from the ship that had just gone. I hardly had time to fill my lungs with air when it was on me. I felt it was no use struggling against it, so I let myself go for a moment or two. Then I struck out, but I felt it was a losing game and remarked to myself mentally, what's the use of you struggling? You're done. And to ease my efforts to reach the top when a small voice seemed to say, dig out. I started afresh and something bumped against me. I grasped it and afterwards I found it was a large hammock. It undoubtedly pulled me to the top, more dead than alive. I rested on it, but I felt I was getting very weak and roused myself sufficiently to look around for something more substantial to support me. Floating right in front of me was what I believed to be the center bulkhead of our pattern 4 target. I managed to push myself on the hammock close to the timber and grasp a piece of rope hanging over the side. My next difficulty was getting on top and I was beginning to give up hope when the swell lifted me nearly on top, and with a small amount of exertion, I kept on. I managed to reeve my arms through a rope, and I must have become unconscious. Midshipman Storley writes about his experience, I was sucked down and down in the water, swallowed pints and a lot of oil and gave up hope, but eventually got to the surface and got hold of a floating life belt. There was nothing left of the ship except some wreckage and a few heads bobbing in the water. After five minutes, the 5th Battle Squadron passed me, 
firing grandly, and all the German shells were falling short and near us in the water. The swell they made in passing washed me under again, and then I got a hold of a plank. About ten minutes later, a division of our destroyers passed and appeared not to see us. In reality, they did and signaled for help, unable to stop themselves. This was the worst part, and a lot of people gave up hope and sank. I was again washed clear of the wood by the swell of these destroyers and went down a bit, but eventually got two bits of wood under my arms and was kept up. Men clung to whatever they could to keep them afloat that being debris in the water. Although it was summer, the North Sea was still bitterly cold, as midshipman Dearden found out. The surface of the water was simply covered with oil fuel, which tasted and smelt horrible. I smothered myself all over with it, which I think saved my life, as the water was frightfully cold. I should say that about 50 hands went over the side, but about half of these were killed during the second explosion. Most of the remainder of us held out on two or three spars and other wreckage on the surface. Shortly afterwards, several of our destroyers came up, but only one stopped. That destroyer was the Laurel, which had been stationed on the starboard disengaged beam of the Queen Mary, where Abel Seaman Albert Hickman was at his action stations as the sight setter on her forward 4-inch gun. We turned to port, and under very heavy fire, started to pick up survivors. This was made extremely difficult because, in addition to the very heavy shelling, the sea was a mass of wreckage and all sorts of ship's parts, wood, and masses of bits of boats and decking. We had lowered our whaler, but the wreckage was so thick we could not force the boat through it. We abandoned the boat, and somehow we were hauled aboard. Then, nearly all of our guns, crew, and upper deck hands were hanging over the side on fenders, lines, and nets trying to get survivors aboard. This was made so very difficult because they were all soaked in oil, and we could not hold on to them for very long, especially as we were steaming ahead as to not present a sitting target to the enemy. We picked up 11 survivors. All except one were in a very bad state. As we steamed away, we noticed about half a dozen survivors on a raft. They cheered us, and I believe they hoped that we would pick them up. The only uninjured Queen Mary survivor we picked up was the left gun layer of the X turret. He was a petty officer, and though shocked, he stood with some of us at the break of the forecastle, drinking a basin of soup. Many of the men in the water were very injured, and that made it difficult to pick them up. Also making it difficult to pick up survivors was the fact that the Laurel could not lose her station as part of the screen covering the battlecruisers for the threat submarines posed. Inevitably, some survivors feared the fate of being abandoned as Laurel steamed off. Some sources say Laurel picked up more men than eleven. Nevertheless, some of the remaining survivors were picked up later. Although Queen Mary missed the Battle of Dogger Bank, there were still lessons to be learned from it. In his book, The British Battleship 1906-1946, Dr. Norman Friedman discusses the lessons learned from Dogger Bank according to Admiral Beatty. The main point was that Beatty did not believe the German shells were that effective, especially the 11-inch shells, and that his ships were hitting effectively, though they were not hitting fast enough. This idea about a fast rate of fire was prevalent in the Royal Navy before the war and during, especially in the battlecruiser squadrons, with a faster rate of fire being preferred over careful calculation. As we discussed previously, this obsession with speed and gunnery led to unsafe practices. To quote Dr. Friedman, Beatty's ships could not fire as rapidly as he might have expected at Dogger Bank because, over the past few years, standard fleet practices had been to overload the magazines and shell rooms. Cordite in magazines was normally stowed in fireproof Clarkson cases. Cordite cartridges were removed from the cases when they went to the hoists. The fuller the magazine, the greater the congestion of the cases at the bottom of the hoist caused. Beatty was not the only one concerned with the rate of fire. After Dogger Bank, his commander, Admiral Jellicoe, circulated a gunnery order pressing for a higher rate of fire and opening fire more quickly, on the ground that, in itself, the British fire on their ships would make it more difficult for German gunners. That is, rapid fire was both offensive and defensive. The problem of the unsafe practices lay in how the officers chose to solve the problem of gunnery speed. They had two ways. We're again taking from Dr. Friedman. One was to stow bare charges in the turrets, in the working chambers, in the handling rooms below the turrets, placed there to break up the direct path between the turret and the magazine, and at the bottom of the hoist. In effect, the working chambers and handling rooms became ready-use magazines carrying unprotected charges. 
A second means of firing more rapidly was apparently to remove the anti-flash doors between the magazines and the spaces at the bottom of the hoist so that cartridges could be passed more quickly. Both practices contravene magazine regulations. I know we could go on and on about the subject, but I have covered it at length in my video on those unsafe practices at Jutland, which I will link to in the description along with a video that shows her wreck. A short time later, after Queen Mary had gone down, where to take from Flag Captain Alfred Chatfield, I was standing beside Sir David Beatty, and we both turned round in time to see the unpleasant spectacle. The thought of my friends and her flashed through my mind. I thought also how lucky we had been in the lion. Beatty turned to me and said, There seems to be something wrong with our bloody ships today. A remark that needed neither comment nor answer. There was something wrong. The destruction of the Queen Mary is probably the most famous out of the three battlecruisers, in part due to this photograph, a truly harrowing image. Nevertheless, thank you all for watching. I hope you found this macabre video interesting, and please remember to like and subscribe as it'll help the channel to grow. Until next time, my friends, have a great week.